of our trial period. Response so far is just incredible. <laughs> A sense of security, peace of mind. The stories we've been hearing, they are truly inspirational. It's completely safe. Sure it is, honey. I'm your host, Audrey Rupert. I'm a second year LLB student at King's College London, and with me today is Jacob Mikowski. Hi, Jacob. Hello, I'm Jacob. I'm a second year politics, philosophy, and law student at King's College London. And today we're going to be talking about the hit series Black Mirror. This specific episode we're going to be discussing is called Archangel, and it deals with a lot of crimes, actually. We're going to have to sort of gloss over some of them because there's so much criminal liability that goes on in this episode. But if you haven't seen it, don't worry, we'll kind of give an overview of what's going on in each of the crimes we're taking a look at today. The first issue we're going to be looking at today is the question of consenting to being recorded with the recording device. So Jakob, can you tell us a bit for background about what's going on in this episode? Yes, so in this episode, the mother implants a chip into her three-year-old daughter after she runs away chasing a cat, and that chip allows her to monitor the child's activity, see through her eyes, and blur out any distressing content, etc. Right, so sort of similar to what news agencies do nowadays when there's distressing content. It pixelates anything distressing that a child might see. So let's first discuss the idea of consent when Sarah, that's her name, was a child. Um, really... If you think about it, parents make all kinds of decisions without their children's consent when they're young. The consent of a child isn't particularly relevant at this point in time. So the fact that Sarah didn't consent to this chip being implanted in her, unfortunately for her later on, isn't particularly relevant. But the uh, issue arises at the point where the mother deactivates the device at 11 and then later reactivates it at 15. Without her daughter knowing. Without her daughter's consent, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we have two issues of consent, really, factual consent and, and consent arising as a result of harm. Mm-hmm. So do you want to explain factual consent a bit? Yeah, sure. So, so consent in a factual sense arises only when the victim has given true consent, or at least the defendant believes that the victim has given true consent. And that's kind of a mute point in this scenario because uh, Sarah was only three. So she couldn't have given real consent. Right. And then when she was 15, she didn't give her consent. However, what's really important in this situation is the harm principle. So we have to kind of ask, was any harm done to Sarah by the reactivation taking place? It's interesting because Jacob and I were discussing this earlier. You could sort of say that there has been some harm caused by this device in a psychological sense. Uh, Sarah's emotional growth has been somewhat stunted, but we noted that that happened before when she was younger. Jacob, would you say there's any harm, tangible harm, that's been caused by the reactivation of the device? Yeah, no, so the only harm happened at the age of three when she was incapable of giving consent. There isn't any substantive harm that was caused by reactivating the device. Sarah didn't know anything about it, she didn't Mm. feel anything about it, and the psychological harm has occurred before that. Yeah, exactly. Um, So when we get into this issue later of her beating her mother with the iPad, I think that you could trace those sort of psychological issues back before the reactivation of the device even occurred. So basically, there doesn't appear to be criminal liability for recording your child, which is a bit messed up. It seems like there's a a gap in the law there that that may need to be addressed. Yes, law is infamous for not keeping up with the times or technology, but hopefully we never get to this point. So now we're going to get into the second issue, which is child porn possession. Can you give us a bit of a background on this, Jacob? Yeah, sure. So uh, at the point when the child is 15, the mother reactivates uh, the device because she's worried about her and she wants to check up on her. And when she does that, she clicks record on the iPad of her daughter having sex with her boyfriend. Uh, And so the daughter is 15, which means she's under the age of consent. And therefore, this makes it child pornography. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the relevant legislation here. Remember, we are in the United Kingdom, so that is the legal framework we're using. So the first act that's relevant is the Protection of Children Act, 1978, and this basically just makes it an offense to take or permit to be taken any sort of indecent photograph of a child. There are a couple defenses to this, though, and so the three main elements of a defense have to be that either you have a legitimate reason for possessing the photograph, which we can get into what that means. Two, that you haven't seen the photograph and you, or you didn't know that the photograph was indecent. And three, the photograph is sent to you without any prior request made and you didn't keep it for an unreasonable time. So this would be sort of like if someone sent you a nude and you 
didn't ask for it and then just deleted it the second you got it. If you are convicted, you are subject to an imprisonment for a term that's not exceeding five years. So as we've talked about in other episodes, to commit a crime, you need to have demonstrated the actus reus, so that's the guilty act, and the mens rea, which is the guilty mental state. But this is a bit of a, a, with most child offenses, it's a strict liability offense. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the mens rea isn't as important. In fact, with strict liability offenses, it, it doesn't matter really what your mental state was. If you committed the act, you're guilty. Um, usually this is used for less serious offenses like parking tickets and that sort of thing. There's a big sort of discussion in English law why there are certain offenses that are considered strict liability when they really shouldn't be. But as for the mental element, that's sort of merged into the defenses in this case. So if you didn't know, for example, that something was being sent to you, that can be considered through the defense element. So now, Jacob, let's kind of go over the different elements of the defense and whether or not the mother could use them. The first one is, did she have a legitimate reason for having this recording? So the way we assess that is against an, an objective standard. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would a sober, reasonable person deem a legitimate reason? And then the question really is for the jury. That's where the jury element comes in and becomes very important in English law. It's for the jury to decide whether an objectively reasonable person would deem the mother to have a legitimate interest. The mother is just worried, uh, but there is an issue of the fact that she hits a record and keeps the video. Right, why did she need to do that? Well, <laughs> she did that for blackmail, which we'll discuss later, but um, that doesn't We're... probably wouldn't be considered a legitimate reason. The yeah. spying, maybe, but I highly doubt that a jury would find this to be legitimate. The second element we don't have to worry about because she did know she had the recording and the third element we also don't have to worry about because it wasn't sent to her, she actively chose to take it. So all those factors considered, she probably would be liable for this. Yeah, it seems like mother does not have a defense. No. The next thing we're going to look at, because there's just so much in this episode, is blackmail. So Jacob, do you want to talk about the blackmail element of this? Yeah, so when the mother reactivates a device at 15, she records her daughter having sex with someone who is 18. Or where his age actually isn't really known, but it's known that he's an adult because he's driving a car, etc. Yeah, and she also records them taking drags together, which, which he gives her. And she can see all of that through her daughter's eyes, through the device. And then she uses that footage, which she has recorded and kept, to blackmail the boyfriend, who's significantly older, uh, into breaking up with her daughter. Right, so we're just going to go into the legal elements now of blackmail. This is under the Theft Act of 1968, which is the bane of most law students' existence, as we will tell you. It takes forever on an exam. Um, the main elements of blackmail are demand. There has to be a demand. In this case, what's the demand, Jacob? It's to break up with the daughter. Right, so that element's fulfilled. The second is with menaces, so something threatening, which is, in this case... Threatening to release the video. Right, fulfilled. Um, it has to be unwarranted. And, Jacob, would you say that this is an unwarranted... Well, that's that's where the interesting part happens. Uh, I think it probably is. Uh, it was because she had no reason to threaten the boyfriend, other than that to protect her daughter. But because the daughter was not being harmed, the mother is not going to be uh, safe from this element. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could discuss whether taking drugs is a harm, etc. But I think there were also other ways that she could have protected her daughter other than blackmailing the boyfriend, yeah. so this is unwarranted. And the final element is there has to be a view to gain or an intent to cause loss. And what do you think here, Jacob? Yeah, so from the, the mother's perspective, she will gain control of her daughter's life, uh, or at least her safety in, in her perception. And the loss of the boyfriend is quite obvious. The video will be released. And then, yeah, he'll be considered a criminal, etc. Yeah. So, yeah, she definitely blackmailed him. Yeah. Um, under this act, she could be convicted up to 14 years for that. And then another offense we're going to discuss here is underage sex, because obviously this girl is 15 years old. In the United Kingdom, under the Sexual Offenses Act of 2003, the fact that she consented to it doesn't really matter because consent is irrelevant for children ages 13 to 15. If the boyfriend had believed that she was over 16, then that could be a defense, but I don't think that was the case here. So therefore, the boyfriend would probably be liable for participating in underage sex. Okay, so the last thing we're going to get into is the most complicated, and this is the sort of physical harming of her mother with the iPad. There are five offenses that this could fall under, but first, Jacob, do you want to give us some background about this? Yeah, so we're moving on to the daughter committing potentially a crime now, uh, and when the daughter finds out that her mother has blackmailed her boyfriend and recorded their sex, and given her a tablet to abort a baby, which she knew that the daughter had or might have had, 
uh, as a result of watching her and is now reusing the device to spy on her without her consent, uh, she confronts her mother and is understandably, to a degree, quite angry. So while the daughter is angry, and perhaps uh, quite understandably, she grabs the iPad that is being used to control the, the device and accidentally activates the, the blur with explicit content setting, which turns her screaming mother into a complete blur. So while she's confused, she lashes out at her mother with the iPad, unable to see effectively what she's doing because it's all blurred out, and she begins to beat her mother with the iPad. And that causes causes considerable damage to her mother's body and uh, after hitting her mother multiple times the blur vision turns itself off it, it deactivates itself and she can see what has happened and upon seeing that what the daughter does is just pack her bags and in, in a state of, of confusion presumably leaves yep so it's it's quite a packed scene really yeah so we're going to go over each of the possible offenses and we're going to try and be as clear as possible because the lines between them can get a bit confusing so one thing I really need to remind the audience to keep clear in their minds is the idea of mens rea, guilty mental state, actus rea, guilty act, and defenses which can reduce a crime to a less serious crime or get rid of the crime altogether. For her actions, uh, Sarah would probably be charged under the Offenses Against the Person Act of 1861. There are five main offenses that we could look at under this act, and this is in order of increasing severity. So the least serious would be assault, then comes battery, then comes assault occasioning actual bodily harm, that's under section 47, then malicious wounding or inflicting of grievous bodily harm under section 20, and the final one would be wounding or grievous bodily harm with intent under section 18. Okay, so first what we need to know is the difference between battery and assault. Assault is generally when someone feels threatened by violence, and that's in effect saying, you know, I'm going to hit you. So Audrey, if I now said I'm going to hit you, that's technically assault. Yeah, uh, I think... Though I haven't got the mens rea for it. <laughs> I think that's really important because assault in colloquial language is like people say oh i was assaulted but that's actually battery so assault in a legal sense is just threatening to harm someone not actually harming someone yeah the actus reus comes from cases like fagan and savage where it's defined as a conduct which causes a person to apprehend the immediate application of unlawful force uh, battery on the other hand is what people usually colloquially refer to as assault actually the actus reus of that is inflicting unlawful personal violence on the victim and Definition can be found in Fagan or, or Rolf. And, you know, it's it's any conduct by which the defendant inflicts unlawful personal violence on the victim, which could include a simple act of touching someone, you know, even mm -hmm. on the street. So what becomes a really important element of this is that the mens rea for both of those offences, because the actus reus is such a low threshold, mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at the mens rea as well. Right, and that's how we're going to determine which of the three final offences that we talked about, section 18, 20, or 47, will be applied. Because it's obviously an assault and battery, but a prosecutor always goes for the strongest charge. So yeah. we're going to look at those three more serious offences now under that umbrella and see which one would apply. So, Jacob, can we sort of go with the first most serious offence that a prosecutor would attempt? So I'll read the uh, section 18 of the statute to you because it's quite simple. It's the unlawfully and maliciously wounding or causing GBH to any person with the intent to cause GBH to any person or to resist or prevent the lawful apprehension or detainer of any person. Right. So I'm just going to try and make this pretty simple. Basically, the actus reus is similar to that of battery. We just discussed what that is. The difference is that it has to be a bit more serious. There has to be grievous bodily harm. Grievous bodily harm was defined in this case called DPP and Smith. Serious can have a variety of meanings. It can be more than trivial, exceptionally grave, or really serious. Although it's ultimately up to the jury, we have to remember that for crimes like this, there's a maximum sentence of life. So the person has to be in very bad condition. We would look for things in the victim such as nearly dying, permanent damage or disfigurement, and months of recovery time. It doesn't seem like that's what Sarah has done here. She has caused serious harm to her mother, but I don't think it would come up to that level. Again, obviously it's up to the jury, but since the sentence is so serious for this crime, I doubt that the jury would find she had reached this level. Now we also have to look into the mens rea element. 
So obviously, if you can't find the actus reus, then the mens rea isn't particularly relevant because you haven't satisfied the crime or the uh, requirements for the crime. But assuming that they did find the actus reus of this offense, let's talk about the mens rea. The mens rea element of this crime is maliciously and with intent, and that's where we start getting into some gray area. So let's talk about the golden rule, which is used to instruct juries on the conventional definition of intention. And here we get into this very famous case called Arne Woolen. In the Woolen case, a man threw his baby against a wall in a fit of anger because he couldn't cope with the baby crying for a very long time. And so the court ruled that there was no intention because in a fit of anger, he wasn't able to satisfy one of the two tests are required for intention. Right, and so the two tests are, the first one is intention in its sort of normal meaning. Was the purpose to cause death or grievous bodily harm? In this case, with the baby, you could say, no, I don't think he intended to kill the baby. He just was pissed and threw it, which it's still really bad, but I don't think it was his intention to kill his baby. The second test is, is death or grievous bodily harm a virtually certain consequence of the action? With Roland, we could argue that throwing a baby against a wall means that a death Yeah, could be this is a very certain. controversial decision, but it was yeah. determined that no, it wasn't completely foreseeable that... <laughs> throwing a baby against a wall would necessarily cause it to die or cause grievous bodily harm. So let's talk about Sarah's mother mm. here. Do you think that she intended to kill or grievously harm her mother? I, I don't think Sarah did uh, intend to do that. And I don't think that her actions made it virtually certain that the, the consequences of, of it would be uh, yeah. death. Also, we have to consider the fact that she had blurred vision, so she didn't actually see what she right, was doing. Right, she didn't see she... what she was doing. And furthermore, she doesn't have the context either. Yeah, um, she didn't have... That might factor a bit more into defenses later, but keep in mind that Sarah doesn't really have a full comprehension or understanding of what violence is, so I don't think that a prosecutor would be able to get this this crime. Although, it's important for us to always think about the fact that just because these are the legal tests that are in place doesn't mean that's how things play out. It often depends on, you know, the jury's emotions and that sort of thing. But if we're being strictly fair and objective, I don't think that she could get an offense of wounding or grievous bodily harm with intent. So, Jacob, do you want to sort of describe the next most serious crime under yeah. Section 20? So the next crime is Section 20, and that's malicious wounding or inflicting of grievous bodily harm. And I'll read you the relevant section again, although it's a little bit more wordy and outdated <laughs> because this is a very old act. It states, Whosoever shall unlawfully and maliciously wound or inflict any grievous bodily harm upon another person either with or without any weapon or instrument, shall be guilty of an offence, and being convicted thereof shall be liable to be imprisoned. So let's talk about the actus reus again. This is very similar to the last one in the fact that I don't think grievous bodily harm has been inflicted, but let's just assume it has. Let's talk about the mens rea. So the key word here is maliciously, and in this case we use a test from a case called Cunningham, and you have to prove something called Cunningham recklessness. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with the long, long history of recklessness. It took a long time to arrive at this test, but basically Cunningham recklessness has what's referred to as a subjective element, requiring that the defendant foresaw that some harm could have occurred from their actions and nevertheless continued regardless of the risk. And I think this is really important to talk about in this case because before Cunningham recklessness, we had an objective test. I remember these two boys set these wheelie bins on fire and they were convicted because a reasonable man wouldn't do that. So that was the case of RNG and another. And as you said, it was a case of two quite young boys who set the fire to some wheelie bins and caused about a million pounds worth of damage. And when the jury was instructed to look at their intention, now they were instructed to look at it objectively, some from the standard of a sober, reasonable person or an adult. And that caused a lot of problems in terms of intention. So we really need to introduce an element of subjectivity there, which is what Cunningham does. It's here. good that we've gotten to where we've gotten, because obviously in this case, Sarah doesn't fully comprehend what violence is and what harm is. So she has special circumstances that should be taken into account. Therefore, it seems like this charge wouldn't go through because the jury could accept that she has no idea about the concept of harm. So now we're going to move to the final and out of the three offenses we spoke about, the least serious offense, which is section 47. So Jacob, could you explain section 47, which is assault occasioning actual bodily harm? So in this case, actually, the prosecution would probably be happy to go for this one because it has the same maximum sentence as section 20 of five years and it isn't as serious a charge as section 18. The main difference with this charge 
starch is that the uh, GBH doesn't have to be proven and it doesn't require an understanding of harm, which Sarah clearly doesn't have. And I think that it's important to discuss the practicality here. Obviously, prosecutors tend to go for the most serious charge. We have discussed this in previous episodes. If they think they can try and prove murder, they'll try murder, and then if it gets reduced to manslaughter, so be it. But it seems like in this case, Section 18 might be just too difficult for them to prove. Mm. So if they had to have a choice between charging with Section 20 and Section 47, they'd choose Section 47 because there's less requirements to fulfill, but the sentence is the same. So let's look at the actus reus. The actus reus is just literally caught copied from battery, which is inflicting unlawful personal violence on the victim or any conduct by the defendant which inflicts unlawful personal violence on the victim. It has to cause actual bodily harm as opposed to grievous bodily harm, which is more serious. Actual bodily harm is defined as any hurt or injury calculated to interfere with the health or comfort of the victim and it must not be transient. Obviously that's occurred here. Her health and comfort has been interfered with and it wasn't transient, so it wasn't like something that just went away very quickly. As for the mens rea, you only need the mens rea of battery, which isn't as serious a requirement as the other offenses we covered. The mens rea of battery is that one needs to intend or to be reckless as to the application of force on another. I think we can say that she intends to touch her mother and cause some amount of harm, even though she doesn't maybe have an understanding of the gravity of the harm that's being done. She clearly wants to inflict some kind of harm. She's very frustrated. So I think... What do you say, Jacob? Do you think she could be charged with this? Yeah, I think it's perfectly plausible. She doesn't need to know what harm is for this or understand the idea of it. She just really needs to do it, which she clearly does. Well, yeah, just to, to, she knows she's causing some amount of pain. I don't think she really understands how serious, but yeah. that, that's enough. Out of the three that we have discussed today, this is definitely the most likely that she would be charged with and uh, quite possibly found guilty of. That is, in an ideal world where, you know, uh, the jury is completely fair and unbiased and there isn't some sort of media circus that might demonize her or her mother or any of the parties involved. I'm not going to go into defenses too much because we literally covered these two defenses, which are insanity and automatism, in our last episode. I'm going to include a link to that in the description box below if you want to learn more about those two defenses, but it's plausible perhaps she could be classified as insane. However, I'd say I'm going to leave that one up to the audience. What do you think? Tell me in the comments because this sort of situation has never happened in real life. It's very difficult to theorize how the courts would treat it. So go ahead and watch that episode and tell me what you think. Okay, that's all for this episode. So again, I've been Audrey Rupert and this has been Jacob. Jacob, thanks so much for joining us on this episode. Thank you for having me. Also, thanks to Professor John Stantonife who fact-checked for us. <laughs>